Conversations with Artists, brought to you by The Smith Gallery and Fine Custom Framing. Hi, I'm Debbie Smith. Welcome to Art Talks. I created Art Talks because I thought it was important for you, the viewer and the buyer, to be able to understand each of the artists and where they come from and what drives them, because that's really important for when you take that piece home to its forever home, that you can continue this conversation. And art is something that brings us together. It raises us, it lifts us, and that is a wonderful thing. And we are so lucky to be able to have art. Today, I'm going to be talking with Mark Dennis, who is a sculptor. So I hope you sit back and enjoy this rendition of Art Talks. Mark, it is so good to have you here in the studio. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yes, and to have your beautiful work here. So I really want to learn about how you create your work, but I also want to learn about you, like where you come from, like what drives you. So when you were a little boy, did you have dreams of being an artist, a sculptor? No. All right. I, I grew up in an artistic family. Okay. As, as you know, my father I do. is an oil portrait painter. Yes. Um, who has had his pieces framed here. Many of them. <laughs> yes, know. he has. Yep. Um, and that's how I met you. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and my mother did ceramics. Oh, I didn't know that. Yep. So you get the two and you've joined them together. Yeah, more or less. When sort I first of. started, I started making baby doll heads for my mother. Oh, okay. You know, she had the standard baby doll bodies, but they had people that wanted their child done. So oh. I would sculpt the head and we would make the mold and she would pull the slip and all that fun stuff. So, so how old were you when you did that? Oh, 15. All right. Yeah. Before that I played. Yeah. You know, so what started making faces then? That's so cool. Yep. So you were not playing baseball, you were making faces. I don't like sports. You don't like sports. <laughs> That's okay. That's all right. I played football. Did you? Didn't like it. No. And where'd you go to high school? Redland High School. All right. right up over the hill. Right up over the hill. Yep. It is indeed. Yep. And then you went to college, but not for sculpting, right? No, I, uh, I snapped my neck playing football Oh. and shifted over to theater. Okay and went from theater to college for theater and uh, got my degree in technical theater. Wow, and you still do technical theater. I do again. I do again. I do again, yeah. yes. But that's, I mean, that's sort of interesting because that's something we have in common too. Yes. But where did you go to school? I went to Mansfield back in the state college days. Oh yes, um, yep. I was accepted at a bigger school for acting, but I couldn't afford it. Oh. <laughs> so I actually started as an actor. Really? And uh, decided I really liked the technical end so much more than being on stage. So what part did you do that wanted you to become an actor? Oh, uh, I was curly in Oklahoma. Okay. Uh, yeah, just, so you were a singer too? Yeah. yeah oh, yeah. oh yeah. wow. Yeah. You don't have to sing today. I'm not going to. <laughs> <laughs> but you still, you don't perform anymore. I do not. You do technical theater. I do technical theater and help as an assistant director with working with the kids to try to get them to move. Oh, well, that's stage. always a good thing. Yeah. 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 But with your sculpture, when you started with your mom and you mm -hmm. did faces, yep. I, I doubt they are as intricate. Well, maybe they were. I started, as they are. Well, actually I started making, um, I liked figures. I liked the shape yes. of figures, more like this. Mm -hmm. um, and I couldn't do faces and hands. So everybody started out with little mittens <laughs> and they looked like they had masks pulled over their faces because <laughs> couldn't do detail work. Yeah. Um, over the years, I have taught myself to sculpt faces. Well, you certainly have. I mean, these faces are amazing. And the one thing that you told me is they're from people that you know. They are all portraits of somebody. Yep. Most of them are people I've met in person. Um, some of them are people I have met online and we've developed relationships and said, hey, can I sculpt you? Um, so they're everybody's, all the faces are somebody. Yeah. <laughs> well, and this, this piece here, and a lot of the things that you do, you told me that you use mythology. Yes. And 
probably from your theater background, you do things because this is called Lear, right? Yes. L I R, mm -hmm. which is the Celtic Pos god of the sea. So Poseidon. Poseidon, yep. Yeah. All right, but it also, to me, looks like Lear from Shakespeare when he loses his eyesight. Yeah. Which, I mean, but that's good, I'm, right? I'm, I'm happy to have someone interpret <laughs> something differently. The way, but yeah. that's, that's what art is. That is, that's what art is. Yeah. Is hopefully you see something that catches your imagination and you bob with the piece. Exactly. So. That's the point. Yep. So with, I know that you have a couple different things going on. Can mm -hmm. you tell me a little bit more about your process so that I can learn mm. and that everybody else can learn like when you start with a piece, you tell me what you do. I don't know. It varies. In most cases, because I sculpt faces, I sculpt the face first. Okay. So depending on the figure, this is this is closer to the size I would do art dolls. Okay. okay so um, in my studio, I have different size skulls that I use. So when I used to do art dolls off Power and McClay, I teach it on a skull so that the structure's there. It oh. makes construction of a face so much easier if it's on a skull. So you have a base? Yes. Okay. So she still has her skull in her because she has been covered with the material. Um, most of these, though, the skull is then taken out. The material hardens, the skull is taken out, and then I can continue on to sculpt the rest of it. And by then, hopefully, they have told me a direction I need to go. But, and you do speak to your, your I pieces. probably out loud, even. I'm not sure. <laughs> That's right. You will come to your studio and see for sure. Yeah. But I think that, okay, so again, tell me, the skull is in her. Yes. And what is her name? Um, that is the Angel of Florence. That was inspired after my first trip to Italy to teach. And that is so cool that you get to go to Italy to teach. Yep. And when are you doing that again? Um, hopefully next year. That would be great. Every other year we've been trying to go. That is so cool. COVID so, got in the way. for. Well, COVID got in the way for <laughs> a lot of stuff. So if you want to learn more about it and want to go sculpt with Mark, I'm sure he will tell you all about it. Sure. <laughs> okay, so we got here with yep. the skull. But this is a, a larger piece. So do you have skulls that are that I big I have too? skulls up to life size. Oh. Because I sculpt up to life size. Wow. So... Some of my installations are life-size torsos, life-size body, depending on what the people want. Yeah. But so you do commission work as well. I do. Yep. All right. Going back to this. Yes. So you have the skull, mm -hmm. and then you take polymer I take a two-part polymer. It's, uh, it's an epoxy clay. Okay. It's called Magic Sculpt. It was developed for um, sign-making industry. So instead of carving signs, you can make your, font, your, your sign out of foam and then coat oh. it with Magic Sculpt or Epoxy Sculpt, depending on the brands that you want to use. And it's a waterproof, frostproof, two-part epoxy. It hardens in about two hours. And for the sign industry, it just means you coat everything and then you let it harden and then you paint it and you have a sign that will last. Um, for me, it is... Uh, you, you sculpt some, and then it hardens, and then I sculpt some more, and yeah. then it hardens, and you can, it'll bond to itself very well. So you work in layers? Yes. All the time, or just normal? Yeah, now in her case, um, primarily she has an armature inside her, but it didn't start, but I didn't, that's not where I was going when I started. I just wanted to make the face. Interesting. So I made the face. And then it's like, oh, I really like her hair, too. So I made the hair. And then decided I'm going to keep going. So I just kept adding until I had the figure I wanted. So there is an armature inside for support, but it's more or less just a couple of rods. Okay, and you craft out. those yourself. Yeah. Depending on what you're inspired to do. Yes, and what has to happen. All for right. instance, on her, her wings come out of the back so there are two two metal rods that go down into her back and they're balanced yeah well so and that i think things that is... don't break and fall apart and, right and yeah. that's important is they have to be balanced yes i mean when they sit they have to sit yep on their own yeah so she's you know because of the weight of her wings she's slightly forward but at that point i knew what i wanted to do so i knew i had to shift her forward 
because of the weight of the wings on the back, yeah. all that fun stuff. But that's something you have to know engineering as well in order to put those wings on there because you know, most yep. people put them on and they'd like fall over. It helped, I managed an art foundry for five years. Where was that? Um, in Lancaster. And what, what did they do there? Uh, we cast um, bronze sculptures. That's, that's all you did? Yeah. All right. Well, see, it tracks back to when I was in college, I had a disagreement with a professor in the theater. Okay. So I shifted over to the art department, which was in the same building for a semester till he was gone. Okay. And uh, in that time, I took classes on not, not sculpting, but handling the materials. So we had a class on carving stone. And we had a class on casting bronze. But to cast bronze, you had to have a subject. Right. So it's like, oh, well, I can sculpt something quick. Right. Well, <laughs> and then we cast bronze. Yeah. And as he said, as long as you have something, you can cast. That so is I neat. would go back to my dorm room and I would sculpt and take it in and we would cast. But so. there's a couple different processes that you must use. Like with her, she's so. I mean, she's just really smooth. Mm -hmm. And then you look at something like this that has so much more right. texture in it. So when you're doing this, are you working it differently than you do this? Yeah, because the two-part epoxy I use it has a water-based element to it, you can use water as a smoothing agent. Oh, just So like the plaster. more you handle it, the more you work water onto the surface, you can get it very smooth. And then additionally, when it's hard, you can drill it, grind it, <laughs> Whatever you want to do Whatever to it. Whatever you want to do. Yes. So, these... so again, if you don't like something, like if I didn't like the head, I can cut it off, stick someone else's head on, or stick a new body on, or change positions. Because, again, I, I, the one thing I don't like about armatures is the general rule is you have to know where you're going to start with, mm -hmm. you know, what angles and all that stuff. Well, I, I don't. I, don't I go as I feel driven to go. So with this, I, with, with bronze, you cast it, you're done. You know, you can cut, you can re-weld. There's a lot of chasing involved. And it did that for years. Um, but this lets me, if I want to come back and twist the torso a little more, make some cuts, twist right. at the appropriate places for a torso, fill back in, anything extra, you grind away, so and you're you back can, in business. You can be like more creative yes. with using the epoxy clay mix. Yep. That's really neat. Yep, and it holds up outside, it holds up inside. Which is very cool. Yep. This piece that's been sold is going to live outside. And it has lived outside for, I believe, seven years now. Yeah, he's so amazing. Yep. Wow. Um, he was actually created at the beach, so he's got some sand in him and uh -huh. <laughs> salt spray. <laughs> that's so neat. <laughs> um, wow. Yep. Wow. Yeah, so after they're, after they're sculpted, then I use a bronze filled paint, which is okay. an exterior paint created by a company that has bronze powder in it. All right, so that's so, what gives it the longevity is the bronze powder. Right, it's also UV stabilized. It protects the clay underneath from ultraviolet light outside. Right. Um, and it gives you the ability to do patinas like you would do for bronze. They're just, well, they say cold patinas, but I do warm patinas, so you can heat the surface okay. of this to a point it makes the metal react as if you were doing it on a bronze. That's so neat. you can get the colors, the greens, the browns. So those colors pretty much come within through. that palette. Well, but this one is it's sort of like a uh, palette green, runs anywhere but... from yellow, orange to red to blue, green, depending on which chemicals you use. Huh. So you're a chemist, an engineer, <laughs> an artist, everything all at once you know, to create these sculptures. A lot of it you learn at the foundry, you know. Yeah. It's, yeah. Because we had people come in and say, I want, there's a perfect black patina and there's, there's one way to make it, which is the way they do it in Italy, and we can copy it yeah. <laughs> on bronze. Okay. It's a little harder to copy on this. So what do you use with the patina, with the black? The black? Pit of sand and goat's milk. Oh. Pit of sand. A pit of sand, a sand pit. Oh, right, a pit of sand. Bury it I thought in. it was like an English thing. Nope. It was like a and pit of sand. And you soak it with goat's milk. Wow. And the lactic acid in the goat's milk turns the bronze black. 
And it can't be any other milk than goat. Nope, goat's milk. And how in God's name did they figure that out? I have no idea Lots of who goats was sitting in Italy, in Italy was. It's probably <laughs> the, the one thing that they had available to them was a goat. <laughs> oh, that is so wild. Yeah, but it's, it's a handed down. We had a, we had a sculptor come who, who works in Italy six months a year, and she said, I need this patina done in the States. And here's how they do it in Italy. It's like, all right, well, all right. we'll learn to do it. Yeah. So we did it. But you're always learning. Yeah. It's and fun. you enjoy that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So a scholar on top of all the other things you are. Try. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I think it's fascinating, though, how you use the mythology. And there was a, uh, something else that you said that you use, not mythology, not Greek mythology, but you also use. Well, let's call it. Uh, Comparable religions of the world because okay. you know if, if it's not your religion you call it mythology. Okay. If it is yours, then it's your religion. You know, to, right. to the Greeks it wasn't mythology; right, it was sure. religion. You know, Christianity became mythology to them. Okay. Okay. So that's a fair it's, it's that's a, a fair assessment, but yeah. I never thought of it that way. Yeah, I mean, we we talk about uh, Native Americans, indigenous peoples, and the the mythology of their. Well, it's not. They're, they're still practicing their religion for the right. most part. Uh, we just practice a different one. Yeah. So it's just religions. You know, there's the Norse religion. There's the Greek religion. There's like 5,000 different recognized religions right. throughout the world yeah. over a given time. So there's 5,000 creation myths. There's 5,000 kings of seas, waterways, trees. <laughs> But there's some relation that. In, in that too, in terms of um, any sort of religion, there's something that's, you know, that is the same or similar. There's a lot of overlap. Yeah. Um, everybody believes they have the only story. Uh huh. But, you know, generations before them had a different story right. with, with the same characters, the same circumstances. So man keeps recreating right. that religious construct the whole way through history. Yeah. And they come up with some really neat characters. Yeah, that's right. You know? We do. Yeah. We do. Yeah. Wow. Well, I think I've got a better idea of how you create. But um, I guess the why you create is because you can't help but? Uh, yeah, it is definitely. Um, if I go too long without sculpting, my wife will send me to the studio because <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it's a calming thing for me yeah. to sculpt. I, I never feel pressure to sculpt. Yeah. Um, I have uh, peripheral neuropathy in my hands, which is oh. constant pain. Oh. But it goes away when I sculpt. Well, that's amazing that so you can find something. Yeah, why not? <laughs> yeah. I would do that too yeah. if I could, but I can't. I mean, you are a master at what you do. Well, thank you. And I'm so, so happy that we have you in the gallery and we can display your work and sell your work and place it and so that people can understand it and have them with them all the time. And I thought one of the coolest things that you did was that you sculpted a woman coming out of a tree because the tree had to be cut down. Is that yes. right? And then, then what was left was just the stump. And then you created something. What did you call it? Well, they actually, they wanted to cut the tree down. They actually did the first cuts of the tree and then the tree re-sprouted. Oh. So the homeowner didn't want to cut down this tree that was there. It's actually a multi-generational home. So his father owned it before he did. Okay. And he's in his 70s now. So uh, the tree has been there his entire life. And he didn't want to lose this tree. So we ended up doing is I took this material and we actually added a figure to the tree yeah so it looks like it's carved from the tree but we didn't damage the tree in any way so that to give the tree its best shot of, to keep and coming back yeah. yes if it'll make a well, couple more years he's happy that's all awesome yeah. that is so awesome so is there anything else that you would like to tell us about yourself or about your work that i didn't cover which i can't imagine i mean there was a lot of information there but I say I, I give information. So that <laughs> That's all you do is give information. That's what I do. Um, no, I, it's the process. The why is just because. I do like faces. I like the human figure. Yeah. I did wildlife art for a while. It's fine. Yeah. It doesn't it, excite me. Um, I do like different faces. Um, I do like figures, so I, I sculpt figures and faces. And that's great. That's and basically we are, what I do. We are lucky and fortunate because of that. And I'm happy to, to be here and 
and have my pieces here. It's yes. a nice location. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this version of Art Talks with sculptor Mark Dennis. So if you would like to come in and see his work in person, it's phenomenal. So I would suggest that, although you can see it here online as well. But if you want to come in in person, we're here at 190 Reno Avenue in New Cumberland, Pennsylvania. Or you can give me a phone call to set up an appointment at 717-774-4301. Send me a text, send me an email, debbie at fineart2u.com. And check us out again on Art Talks. It's Art Talks to You. So thank you so much for dropping in on this conversation. I hope you enjoyed it. And please like it, share it, and subscribe, because that's the way we make art go out into the world. Thank you. We'll see you next time. Art Talks.